my favorite daughter-in-law. Eh, she's my only one, but she is my favorite. So, you know, before you have Jesus, before you have him in your heart, before you receive salvation, it's a dark place. Right? We stumble through life trying to figure it out, thinking we have the answers, thinking we have a way of of getting through this all by ourselves, that we can handle this, that there's no, you know, I've, I've been taught, I've been trained, I've been raised, I'm fine, I can do this on my own. But the truth is, without Jesus, we're still in the dark. I want that to resonate with you this morning. I want it to resonate with you that without him, you are in the dark. You have no hope, you have no chance, you have nothing but, but just sorrow. Even if you think life is good, you're in the dark, and you're destined to hell. Hell's a real place. It's not a desirable place. But with Jesus, but with Jesus, you'll have all you need. Some of you might be thinking, well, it's still a little dark in here. Oh, but he makes a way. He makes a way for you. Simple, simple, five-letter word. That when you cry out those five letters, when you cry out to Jesus, everything changes. Or at least it should if you're really crying out to him. I want to talk with you guys today about a few things. There's been some stuff on my heart, and I've I've really appreciated the last couple weeks because I've been able to just work through some stuff that the Lord has laid on my heart. And and I've just processed some things about about salvation and, and sanctification and what it really means to serve. Because in this life, you know, you either have Jesus or you don't have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, I get it, you don't understand. Because there was once upon a time when, when Dustin didn't have Jesus either. I didn't get saved until I, till I was after 20 years old. I spent 20 years in the dark thinking I could figure it all out. But when I got him, I started to realize a little bit every day about how I didn't have a clue about how I was supposed to do it. Because this world doesn't point you toward Jesus at all. It points you away. So there's some stuff I want to talk about today. We throw up that first slide. Thank you. She's so fast. So I want to talk about this. We're going to be talking about it for the next couple of weeks. Because as I was writing and writing and writing and the Lord was just flowing out, I'm like, well, I can't, I can't even fit that into a day. So it's not going to be a day. It'll be a couple weeks worth. But today we're going to talk about salvation. But I want, to, I want you to understand these three things are three things that, that, that we, should, we should always be thinking about. And they all have something to do with one another. Because when you get saved, this is the process. Sanctification. That's a lifelong process. And then, and then you got serving, which is the natural thing to do once you have Christ. It should be the natural thing to do. Matter of fact, if you're not serving, you're like, you're, you're really pushing against what he's got for you. <clears throat> That's not a safe and comfortable place to be, is it? That's a hard place to be. But here's what's awesome is when you look at sanctification and serving, they all point back to salvation. That's how people know if you're saved. Scripture says you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by the process of sanctification, meaning there is change, progress in their life, constantly and consistently. Is every day perfect? No. 
but there's change and movement in the right direction toward Jesus from the old you that died that day you got saved to the new you who is being groomed and changed and chiseled by God. Not groomed by this world, which is ugly. But for, but for, but for a kingdom. And so I want you to know the fruits of salvation is the identification of your sanctification and your evidence of serving. That's the truth of it. And the evidence of your salvation is seen by those. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to I dive a little deeper into, uh, into a few things. But I want to talk about this real quick. Sanctifications and serving, right, are evidence of salvation. That's the truth. And I was, I was looking and reading and, and studying and going through some stuff, and I started looking at training. I'm reading this book by Greg Rochelle, and I love it. And, and, and he talks about training a lot because he's like, quit trying because trying leaves open the door for failure. And he talks about training because training is a process of constantly pushing toward your goal. If you try, when you say, I try, I'll try, I'll try that. I'll try to lose weight. Well, guess what? You're opening, you're leaving a window. If you just say, I'm trying, well, you're, you're already saying I'm halfway willing to say that I failed because I just tried. But if you say, I'm going to do it because I'm going to train in my life to succeed in that, then things are different. You know, back in, the, you know, Paul talks about the, 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 the games a lot. You know, he talks about racing a lot and, and, and all the games that they used to have back in the day. And they'd, they'd all gather up and they'd have these games and kind of like the Olympics are now, but a little more intense probably. But they would train. These people would train, train, train. You know what train means in Greek? In gymnasio, which means to literally <coughs> train naked. They trained with no clothes on because they were not going to let one thing get in their way of the victory. We aren't even willing most of the time to put in half effort. I'm not telling you to, that you got to take off all your clothes and train, but I'm telling you to start to put in the effort. That, that was what, you know, he talked about they ran a race, and they ran a race to win the race. So when they're, they're training, they're literally going out and they're running and they're running and they got no clothes on because they don't even want their garments of clothing to get in the way of their victory. What are you letting get in the way of your victory with Christ? It may not be clothing, but we let so many things get in the way of our victories with Jesus every single day. Because we don't treat it as if we're training. We treat it as if we're trying. And if we fail, well, we'll restart tomorrow. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm notorious for weight loss plans. I'm great at it. I've been doing this 75 hard for seven days now. It's day seven. And, I, and, and you've got to work out twice a day. You've got you to read 10 pages of a nonfiction book. You have to drink a gallon of water. You have to stay on a diet, which mine's 2,000 calories or less, and I'm on my seventh day. But before this, before this week, yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. Derek knows. He's like, oh, I get it. Derek's training too. But, you know, you, here's the deal. The last two years, you know how many times I've tried that? You know how many times I've tried 75 hard? I can't even count it because I would try it, and when it got inconvenient, I would quit and try again Monday. But we do that with our walk with Jesus. Well, I'm just a big screw up. So maybe I'll start again Sunday at church. I can't certainly do anything on a Thursday. But when Jesus says, I want you to train for victory with me. And so I want you to, I want you to flip over to Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. And I, and I want you to I want you to listen. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I got somebody in here that grab you one. You can have it. And I want you to listen to this because the first step before we can ever talk about sanctification, which we'll really get into, and we'll talk about serving, we'll really get into it. We have to understand what our salvation means 
And not just like, yay, we got saved, but like, yeah, I'm going to live it out. <coughs> In verse 8, it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Nothing else. Nothing else. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not, and that not of yourselves... It is a gift of God. Before I go any further, I want you to understand that you get saved by faith. 1% of faith is all it takes. Well, pastor, that doesn't seem like a lot. God is a big God. He is really waiting for you to have that 1% of faith to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then he's going to work with you on that other 99% as you train. But you have to be willing to train. You've got to be willing to train so that you can, listen, not that of yourself. You didn't do anything but believe at least 1%, half a percent, point zero 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 one of a percent. That's all the faith it takes to get saved. That's all it takes. You want to know there's no fancy prayer to get you saved? Did you know that? Did you know that most of the time people are saved long before they come down here because they had faith to step out and say, I need Jesus. And by the time they say that with their mouth, we pray a prayer of celebration, not of salvation. Understand that. You didn't get saved because someone led you in prayer at an altar one day. You got saved because you told them verbally, I need a Savior. Because Scripture says that you believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. Not that you say a fancy prayer. We all love prayer though, right? So there was a, there was a young man. I'll share this with you. I wasn't going to, but might as well. My wife's not here to yell at me. We're good. So there was a young man, and uh, he goes to this grocery store, and he, he, he buys three boxes of chocolates, a small one, a medium size, and a large one. And he goes with the cashier, and he goes, hey, I need to buy these. And he goes, oh, that's awesome. It's, you got a date or something or a couple dates? What's going on? He goes, oh, no, I've got a plan. So the young man tells the, tells the, the guy at the grocery store, he goes, if she, uh, if she holds my hand... She gets the small chocolate. Now, if she, if she gives me a peck on the cheek, she'll get a medium chocolate. But if at the end of the night I get a kiss on the lips, she gets the big chocolate. He's like, oh, well, good luck on your date. And sends the, sends the young man on his way. And then a young man shows up at the house, knocks on the door. Dad answers, says, oh, come on in. Come on in. We're going to have dinner. You need to hear with us. He's like, oh, oh, okay. And the, so the, the young lady comes in, and they all sit down to eat. And, and he goes, can I pray? And he goes, okay, okay, absolutely. And he says this prayer that is just blow your mind. I mean, it was King James himself would have been amazed. Like there was, there was more 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 great words and, and more amazing context in this prayer than, than, any, than they had ever heard. And he said, amen. The girl that he was on a date with said, I did not know you were religious. And he said, I did not know your dad worked at the grocery store. <laughs> that's, that's just an extra. You can cut that out if you want, Aiden. That's, that's just a bonus for today. So anyway, let's go back to this. You don't get saved by some fancy prayer. You get saved by doing what God says. You believe and you have faith. And by grace, you are saved through your faith, through that little minuscule of faith you start off with. It is a gift from God. I want that to resonate inside of you right now. Because if you get nothing else, I want you to understand that today. It is the gift of God. And what are we doing with the gift we get from God? I want you to ask yourself today, what am I doing with the gift of salvation that God has given me? What am I doing with it today? How am I showing people that I have this gift? 
Or have I left it and put it on the shelf and I'm keeping it hidden myself? Or am I walking through this sanctification process? I'm training every day, reading this word. I'm training for victory every single day so people can see the victories through my life. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works. You can't work your way into salvation. Stop trying. If you're saved in this room right now, I want you to understand this right here is what people struggle with. When you invite someone to church and they're like, I just can't go yet. They might be thinking that they've got to get something fixed before they walk in the church house. Because they might be thinking, well, God would never accept me looking like this. I've got to get some stuff. I've got to do some work first. I've got to get some stuff changed first. But we, we don't work ourselves into salvation. The reason we can't do it because he doesn't want any of us to be able to boast over, look how I got myself saved. Look how I got me saved. The only thing I can do in my salvation is have a little bit of faith that Jesus is who he says he is. That he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected by the God Almighty. That's all I have to believe. And I don't even have to know what this book says yet. I just have to believe that that could be true. And that he did that for me so that all my sin was was carried to the cross so I don't have to have it anymore. You see, what I don't understand sometimes in our walks, and I struggle with this myself. I'm not just beating up on you today. I'm beating up on me. I don't understand why we don't walk around like this gift of God is just, and, and, and show the world this gift. Instead, we walk around li- living our life the way we want to live it and, 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 and not even putting the gift of God out front. One of the first things people should know about you is that you are a child of God. That should be one of the first things they know about you. They should know it by the way you talk, by the way you walk, by the music you listen to, by the things you say. That's the process of your training. If you've never changed since you got saved, you've not begun training yet. But you're probably boasting in your own walk then. In your walk, not the one God has for you. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Understand this process. Salvation, sanctification, and service. They all are a continuous process. I don't stop being saved. I keep walking it out, showing people my gift. Let me show you my gift. Let me show you my gift. Oh, you don't know Jesus? Well, let me show you my gift. He gave me this. He'll give it to you. But how do people know you're saved if they don't see you showing the gift that God has given you? Grace. He's given you grace. Flip over to Exodus 14. Verses 13 through 14. Because we love some Old Testament, right? So often people say, well, that's kind of irrelevant nowadays. Not one bit irrelevant. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. He will fight for you. He doesn't tell you to fight for him. You know why? Because he doesn't need you to defend him. The last one that would ever need us to defend him is the creator of the universe. I think he has things well under control. He doesn't need me to say, you've got to stop talking about him like that. What he needs me to do and wants me to do is say, I want to tell you about him. I want to tell you about his grace that he gave me when I was no good and worthless. 
but he still gave it to me because I had a little bit of faith. That's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to sit around in Facebook, argue, Facebook arguments and Instagram arguments about what this scripture means and who Jesus is and how it works. He wants you to simply say, Jesus loves me, save me by grace through my faith that I had in him. He was so good to me. I didn't have to go clean myself up first. I didn't even have to, I didn't have to take a shower. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't even have to stop in any sins yet. All I had to do was say, I needed a Savior because I needed one. And he showed up and he did what he does. And he saves people. He says right here, he says, listen, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. Is anyone looking at your life and saying, stand by and look at that salvation? Stand by. I just want you to look at that person. Have you ever seen someone that you're in awe of because of their grace that just oozes off of them? Because they are training day and night to be closer to the Lord, and they are doing everything they can to understand who Jesus is so they can walk more like him. And you look at those people and you're like, I just want to stand and see it. Oh, that's so cool. Or do you sit there and look at them like, why does God love them more than me? Why does God give them those blessings and not me? Well, have you tried training because he's waiting to bless you in the training? He's waiting to meet you on the field. He doesn't care how fancy and dressed up you are. He wants you to realize and express the fact that you are a disaster and you're messed up. And that you need him for victory. Because the only place we go without Jesus is straight to defeat. Let that resonate. Straight to defeat. You may even think, man, I had a really good day. Look back and be like, well, I didn't even pray today. I didn't talk to Jesus. It doesn't matter how good your day on earth was. You were still defeated if you didn't talk to your father. You were still defeated. Because you didn't let Jesus have some victory in your day. And it says, he will accomplish. He will accomplish. He will accomplish. He will accomplish for you. How awesome is that? Who in here believes today that God will accomplish things for you? We've got to live like it. We've got to live like we truly believe God will accomplish some things for us. You know what we live like most of the time? I'm just going to be real with you. We come to church. We sing some songs of praise and worship, which are awesome. But we live, we don't live, we don't live like that. If we went to church like we lived, you know what it looked like? I'm going to borrow your chair, brother, because I'm going outside. We'd look like this if we went to church like we lived. I'm kind of in, God, but I'm also out because it's inconvenient to be all the time in. I think I'll just kind of hang out here, and if you need me, I mean, just let me know, and I'll see if I got time. If we went to church like we lived, but if we go to and live like we go to church, man, our jobs would be different. Our, our life would be different. School would be different. Everything we do would be different. Like he can accomplish it for us today. If we actually believed that he was going to accomplish something for us right now, we pray like he could, but do we pray like he will? I'm not saying he's going to answer every single one of your prayers. I'm not saying every single healing you pray for is going to happen. But what I'm saying is, he won't leave you alone in it. He won't leave you alone in it. If you are saved from something, you should change. And where is the gratitude in that? What's the definition of salvation? It means to literally be delivered from sin or damnation. 
We don't talk about that enough in church, the bad side. We try to put the glowing side out there a lot. Well, I can't say that too much about us, Hayden, I guess. We, we tell people they're going to hell if they don't get their act straight. But we need to be sure that there's a clear understanding that there is a hell just as much as there is a heaven. That we have to understand that that matters. That, th- that salvation is literally the deliverance from sin. It's literally the, the deliverance from damnation. So when you chose to, to have that little bit of faith, In Jesus, he saved you from damnation. That's massive. That's a big deal. And Satan is ticked off when that happens. And his goal is to do everything he possibly can to change who you are in that that victory training process. He does not want you to celebrate victories on any day, especially every day. He does not want you to try to walk in grace. He wants you to try to walk in confusion and hurt and sorrow. When Jesus says, I want you to walk in joy and grace, even when the world is sorrowful. What is so special about you? Ask yourself this. What is so special about you that Satan doesn't want you to realize? What's so special about you in here today? Every one of you have a gift, gifts, multiple gifts inside of you. When you have Jesus, that he is waiting and waiting and waiting for you to just just be obedient so he can use them. Yet we let the enemy confuse us and cause us chaos in our minds, and we limit the ability to be used. We can't limit God. He can still do everything but we limit our ability to be used because of our unwillingness to tell Satan, it's not his, I belong to Jesus. We have to understand, we have to change that. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. So while you're training, sure, it's easy to get up in the face of people and it's easy to argue with people. But sometimes keeping silent is where it's at. While you train and you train and you work with God and he shows you how to live and you walk it out and you train and you train. And then you know what you start sharing? Not arguments. You start sharing your testimony of God's grace in your life. Not the woe of who you were, but the grace of who you've become. The best testimonies are the ones that take forever about all the goodness God has done for me. You might be like, well, I don't even know that I have one. Well, then here's the deal. Today, let it be your day of victory. Let it be your day of victory, your first day of victory. And then tomorrow when you wake up, don't say, I'm going to try. Quit trying. Start training out your walk With Jesus. Go to that mirror in your bathroom and look in the mirror and say, I'm not trying anymore. It's victory. Every single day, in some form, in some way, Jesus will have victory in my life every day, and I'm going to tell the world how good he was. Because that is what it's about. Flip over to John 3.16. I like 3.16, but I like 17 through 21 better. Because I think we get a little lost sometimes. We stop at the really exciting point, but God has more. I love it. You know, those old game shows, you want more? We got more. Jesus has more. Come on down. I'm a little excited. Y'all didn't let me preach for two weeks. Whoo. 316 says, For God so loved the world, right? We've all heard that. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is what it's about. That is our goal. That is our first goal. First goal. 
There's got to be other stuff than just the first goal, though, right? This is the first goal. Get in a relationship with Christ so that I don't go to hell, that I can spend eternity with him, and I can be forever in his grace. And every single day I can start training for victory with the best coach out there. But in verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know why that's just as exciting for me as 16? Because that's not just me, that's my family. That's not just me, that's everybody else too. He didn't just come for me. He didn't just come for you. He came for our families. You know the ones that drive us up the wall? You know the the people that we work with that we can't stand? Do you know that he came for them too? The ones that you avoid and you dodge every chance you get because, man, I don't know what that's going to involve. For them too. He who believes in him is not judged He who does not believe has been judged already. Guess why? Because they're still on their way to hell. Our judgment from our first moment on the earth, our judgment for that is to go to hell. Obviously, there's an age of accountability. Praise the Lord for that. That's grace. But once we hear the truth and we know the truth, we have a decision to make. And he says, if you don't believe, then you've already been judged. You're going to hell. But here's the deal. You can believe. And you can say, not getting judged by like that. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. Not not for me. I'm not going to hell. I can proudly say in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of Dustin, because there's no pride there. But my God is good. And in the name of Jesus, I know I'm not going to hell. And my, my hope and my prayer is that everyone in this room can say that at least by the end of today. That you can say, I'm not worried about what's going on outside those doors right now. I'm worried about my sanctification walk with Christ. But before I can worry about that, i got to have me some Christ. I need to get saved. I want to have this life of victory. I want to see things change. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does not, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. See, that breaks my heart for all those people that say, well, I just can't go up there and get saved. I can't, I can't go down there and cry out to Jesus. I can't go to church yet because I got to get cleaned up. They're afraid of the light because the things that they have done and the sin that they have lived out will be exposed. Guess what? It doesn't have to be exposed to each other, but it's going to be exposed to Jesus who knows about it already. However, I will tell you multiple times in the scriptures, he says to tell one another. You know why he tells us to tell one another instead of just telling Jesus when we're struggling? Because he wants us to hold each other accountable. He wants us to talk to each other and and say, you know what, I'm struggling in this. I'm struggling what I'm watching. I'm struggling what I'm saying. Man, I'm struggling in how I'm handling this situation. I'm struggling in my marriage. I'm getting mad all the time. I'm struggling in this. I'm struggling in my job. I'm I'm a different person than there than I am anywhere else. He wants us to tell each other that, tell other believers that. You know why? So your brothers and sisters in Christ don't go gossiping about you, but so they can say, you know what? I'm going to hold you accountable with that. I'm going to call you every day. I'm going to text you every morning. How you doing? Have you let Jesus have a victory today at work? You know, I I just told you I'm doing 75 hard, which is is ridiculous, but I'm going to complete it. And I have an accountability partner on it, and I got my accountability partner is Logan Rust. And here's the deal. He texts me all the time. He texts me multiple times a day. 
And he expects me to text him back. You know why? Because I've struggled in my gluttony in the past. I've shared that with you guys. And that's a very serious sin just as much as anything else. I've struggled in gluttony more than I care to admit in my life. And obviously I have the physique to show it. And so I have an accountability partner because I want Jesus to have a victory in that every single day. Because I identified the problem, because I noticed it, and the Lord showed it to me, and now I want a victory in it. The same thing when I struggle in reading the Word. I want victory in that. So you know what? I have an accountability partner for that. I have a, I have a young man right over there that sends me Scripture and says, How are you doing on your studies? I don't, I don't, and I don't count it my, my getting prepped for sermon study. I have to be in the Word myself Hey, now it's gone too long. Still got my shoes and shirt and pants on, though. We're good. I'm training. I'm getting necking. <laughs> Not really. Why is everybody leaving? No, seriously, though. Yeah, I got an accountability partner for that. He messaged me and says, hey, where are you at on that? Where are you going? How are you doing? Because I need to, I want to be sure that I'm not getting out of this. I want to be sure that I'm in this like I need to be. I'm supposed to have rest. We're supposed to have rest, right? You get, you get rest. Are you, are you taking rest? Because God says get rest. I have an accountability partner for that. James messaged me every Friday. He says it's a great day to do nothing, pastor. It's your day off. Don't do anything. And sometimes I'm like, well, today I've got, well, he's like, that's not rest. What are you going to do? He holds me accountable in it. Because that's things I need in my life that I won't do if I don't have somebody holding me accountable. What do you got going on in your life that you need to tell a brother or sister in Christ to, hey, hold me accountable in that. Hold me accountable in this because I don't want to fail. I want to have victory with Jesus in it today. That's what your salvation should look like because that is what we're supposed to show the world. That's how we grow past that 0.0001% of faith because that's the training process and he never meant for us to train alone get people and train with you everyone who does evil hates the light I don't want to do evil because you know if I do evil we know what that means if I'm doing evil I hate God by by definition I don't want to be known as that. I don't want that to be my fruit. I don't want the world to say, well, you see that pastor, he gets up there and preaches, but then he goes and does that. So does he really love God? I want him to say, you know what? He realized he had a problem. He got an accountability partner. He's working it out so there's victory every single day. Does that mean I win every single battle? Maybe not, but I'll have victory every single day because I'm not trying. I'm training it out. Verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light. You practice, you train. Train, practice. Those are interchangeable. Are you practicing out your walk with Jesus today? Or did you just say, well, I got saved. That was cool. I got saved. That was fun. So that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Manifested, made clear, seen, logged, so that it is noticeable. And what does rot mean? Literally, if you look up rot in the dictionary, it means to change, to be worked, to be made. And the, and the crudest of definition means to be, be beaten out or shaped by a hammer. So don't expect the process to always be fun. Don't expect the process to be just smiles and grins all the time. Training is hard. I promise you, when those people were running and running and running for those games back when Paul's day, and they're running in these tough places, and they're naked, none of them were thinking, this is easy. (laughs) They were getting sunburns where sun shouldn't hit. They were going through things and dealing with stuff that nobody should have to deal with, right? Right? Because they were training for victory. So when you go through some hard times in your life after salvation, 
understand it's part of the training process. So long as you're doing it with Jesus, there will be victories inside of it. I love victories. I'm a very competitive person. So, salvation has to be had. Because there's something inside of you that Satan doesn't want you to realize. He doesn't want you to get saved. He doesn't want you to receive Jesus. He doesn't want you to have salvation. He doesn't want you to walk out a sanctified life. And he certainly doesn't want you to serve. So if you're not serving, congratulations, you're doing exactly what Satan wants. If you're not serving in some way God's, in God's ministries, then you are doing exactly what Satan wants. So when I go back to that question of what's inside of you that Satan doesn't want you to realize, well, what it is is Jesus. He doesn't want you to realize, first, that you can have him. Second, that when you receive him, he can use you. He doesn't want you to realize either one of those things. Because the moment you realize that, the moment you realize I'm unstoppable. And I don't care what anybody says to me. I don't care. People can mouth me, talk trash about me, tell me I'm an idiot, call me goofy, say I'm dumb. I don't care one bit because every single day I'm going to wake up and it's about Jesus and that day's victories in him. And I expect the world to hate me because they hated him first. So is it dark in your life still? Are you still stumbling around? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm telling you, this brother named Chris got saved on Thursday night. Come into real life. Come to talk to me afterwards. And I told him, hang on just a second outside. I'm going to run inside real quick. And he came in after me. And I turned around. And he goes, I also want to talk to you about salvation. I want to get saved. And then he started bawling. I said, brother, I think you just got saved. Because you said it with your mouth. And you believed it in your heart. So then Benji and I talked to him for a while. Now he's got to work every day to train and get victories in his life. But he made a decision that day as a grown man. Not afraid of what the world might say if he cried. To get saved. Now my prayer for him is that he'll go out and, and walk out that salvation. He'll show the world his gift. Come see my gift I got from God today. If you need to come down to this altar, you need to ask God, hey, Lord, where am I at on that? Am I showing the world the gift that you gave me? Does my own family know I'm saved? Does, does, my own, does my own friend group know that I'm saved? Does my boss at work know that I have Jesus Christ inside of me? I'm telling you, everybody needs to know. Everybody needs to know that gift. You've got to tell them. You've got to tell them. That's your first victory. That's your second victory. Getting it and then telling it. Show them. Listen, I don't know what's going on in your life. We all have stuff. We all have garbage we're working on. I got a wife that's been sick for two weeks now. Poor girl. I'm trying to feed the family. I don't even know what's happening there. My daughter might be starving to death. I don't know. You may bring her food if anybody sees her. But everybody has stuff going on. Maybe your marriage is a struggle. Maybe your parenting's just tough. Maybe you're having a tough time in church. Maybe it's because you're still sitting outside and you haven't come in yet. Well, pastor, I'm in the room. No, 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 no. I mean, are you outside in your thoughts? Did you enter into the church house waiting for a victory today? Did you enter into this building saying, Jesus, today you're going to get victory in my life, and I can't wait to see what it's about. 
Because if you didn't come in expecting that, I pray right now that you change your mind and decide that today, before you leave this building, you'll go down to that altar and you'll ask him for some victory today. Man, who doesn't need victory today? The altar's yours. Let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen. So the pastors are going to be out by the door. If you have any questions, anything that popped up today while you're here with us at Renovation Church, um, make sure and take it to them. Folks, there's so much going on. We're so glad to have you here. If you show up once, we kind of adopt you into the family anyway, so you might as well get to meeting people. Um, Wednesday nights, we have a great study going on. If you can, can come by. Next weekend, we're going to have a baptism service. Um, if you haven't been baptized, know anyone that hasn't and wants to, that would be a great time to come in. Um, after this service, we're having men's prayer over in the new building. So, um, guys, come on over. We're going to pray for the service, pray for the church, that kind of thing. Oh, so I wanted to share with you folks a quick tool. Um, it's kind of hard to Bible study if you haven't done it before. So this is for some of you folks. And just if you're curious, for you to be a pastor 100 years ago, the library you would have had would have cost you tons of money. A um, 1,000 years ago, if you'd have been a, a church member, you couldn't have got to a Bible. Okay, there was no printing press. It just wasn't out there. And I just want to show you guys, all you people who've been called to work for the Lord, I want to show you how cheap and how easy it is to get to some good Bible study materials. So this thing is called Blue Letter Bible. There's a ton out here like this. So um, Tara, could you let's do? Could you go up here and click study, please? Now the app is actually easier than, than what we're doing. If uh, see this study right there, if you could click that, if you could go to click text commentaries, you guys are going to dig this. This is really cool. Go down here to this guy named David Guzik. Yep. Go to David Guzik's study guides. Go all the way down to Galatians. Well, you've got it on your screen. Okay, Galatians. <laughs> no, down one more. Galat Galatians. Okay, there you're totally blowing this, and I am too. Galatians. Five. Five. <laughs> this is kind of fun. I'm kind of enjoying this now. So this is an outline for Galatians 5. And while I'm talking, could you scroll down to 522? I want to just show you how much is out there. Okay? There are, so these people who are putting these outlines together, they're taking all these old beautiful writers like Spurgeon and Luther and all of them, and they're putting them together. So check this out. So this is, um, we should get down to 522. Uh, back up a little bit. This is working so well. Okay, so this is 522. So let me read this to you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Who was it said that? You're talking about putting together a lesson, right? Check this out. Go down until you see, uh, oh, whoa, right there. So check this out. This is how easy you can get into an in-depth Bible study. Okay, so we went to Galatians 5.22, and it talked about the fruit of the Spirit is lo of love, right? Let me read this to you, and this is from an old pastor named Barclay, and this is something to just uh, think about this week. Right on, baby. I know this is taking a long time. There's some beautiful studies out here. Listen to the, this little study about the word love. Love translates the ancient word, Greek word agape. In that language, there were four distinct words for love. Eros was the word for romantic or passionate love. Philia was the word for the love we have for those near and dear to us, be they family or friends. Storge is the word for the love that shows itself in affection and care, especially family affection. This is cool, though. But agape describes a different kind of love. It is a love more of decision than of the spontaneous heart. 
as much a matter of the mind than the heart because it chooses to love the undeserving. Agape has to do with the mind. It is not simply an emotion which rises unbidden in our hearts. It is a principle by which we deliberately live. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you because that's pretty cool. So all you folks, if you have a name that has either a consonant or a vowel in it, you are called to go do some good stuff for God. Okay? Um, I wanted to, there are so many of these websites out here right now that are great study sites, and you can get so far with it, but I promise you, this is part of how you can grow in the Lord and do it on the cheap today. God is moving for a reason, and he's putting these tools right here at our disposal. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just bow before.